Hello to all my sports card investor and collector friends. Thank you for joining me again for another video. Uh, first off, let me just address the elephant in the room. I have um, somehow managed to, while playing with my little ones uh, last week, picked up poison ivy. So if you look, my, my eye over here is a little bit shut on this side and looking a little funky. Um, and that is because of, of poison ivy. I don't know if it got a little bit on my eyelid or, or what happened there, but I am struggling quite a bit. So apologies, um, a little bit raggedy today, but um, yeah, I'm coming to you anyway. I wanted to make sure that I, that I got my video out for the day. But today I am talking about the importance of scarcity in sports card investing. And the reason why I'm talking about this, and I want to add a caveat to it that is interesting, but the reason why I'm talking about this is because, you know, right now there's just a ton of money flooding into sports cards right now. And I first saw this, um, I got back into collectibles uh, two years ago. So it was more, and actually it was more on the comic book side. So, you know, when I was a kid, I was collecting X-Men and Spawn and some of those early image comic books for those of you that crossed over and did both comic books and sports cards. Um, and what I noticed was is in, in, on the comic book side, grading companies were grading them, one to 10, same sort of deal, uh, similar grading. And you know the cost depended upon the grade, similar to sports cards. So I was like, oh wow, that's intriguing. One thing that I like about sports cards a little bit better is, is that there's definitely more fluctuation in price. There's certainly more flipping opportunities that I've seen anyway, uh, to where comic books are more reliant on you know, Marvel movies coming out or a show coming out or an announcement of something, whereas sports cards literally change price on, you know, guy has a 50 point night in basketball, you know, or has a two home run game and prices move up based on that. So I liked sports cards better because it seemed like there's just more flipping opportunity. But um, anyway, you know, when I got back in, I noticed that, you know, you have the grading companies and you have all these different sets and that's something that, that was quite a bit different from what I was collecting when I was a kid is that now you've just got a ton of sets ton of rookie cards for each player and you know I have noticed I know that you know in basketball for example silver prism is the king you know and that's kind of where what everybody flocks to as a card that is fairly easily tradable in the sense that you know, you can, you can always find a lot of PSA 10s typically on a player, especially a popular player, if we're talking about like a Luka Doncic, for example, or a Trey Young. So they're easily accessible and they're easy to sell. Or it's easy to find price comparisons. So I do understand the, you know, the draw to Silver Prism. And I do think that over time, Silver Prism, you know, is going to be, it's still going to be a card that everybody goes. I think 25 years down the road, that Luka Doncic Silver Prism is still going to be a card that people want. I mean, we see that with, you know, the 89 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. that's now going over $1,000, and there was a million of those printed. There's over 3,000 PSA 10s, and those have more than doubled in price over the last 60 days. So you are seeing where even though if a card was printed a lot, there's a lot of supply, as long as there is a lot of demand there, then, you know, that price will, you know, has the ability to go up. Um, the one thing I want to hit on, I'm big on the, you know, the laws of supply and demand. So I am all about scarcity and whether I'm right or wrong, I feel that in the long run, those laws are going to be right. So there could be outliers where, you know, you have the, the Luka Doncic uh, silver prism that can be kind of the outlier to this conversation, but I'm not as worried if I've got rare cards on a guy, you know, so, you know, the law of supply and demand is is defined as when if demand increases and supply remains unchanged then it leads to a higher equilibrium price and quantity if demand decreases and supply remains unchanged then it leads to lower equilibrium price and quantity so you know i think the caveat with all of this and one thing that'll be very interesting to see and and just something that you know i think that we should watch especially with like this 89 upper deck ken griffey is a great example of it there's more than 3,000 PSA 10s out there, but, but the question is, is how many people are selling them? You know, because it's fine if there's 3,000 out there, but, you know, if 2,500 or 2,900 people are just holding them because they're like, hey, look, you know, that's a piece of my childhood. That's a piece of my nostalgia. You know, that's, I'm holding that forever. I'm passing that down to my kids, you know, then that card is not hitting the market. So even though there is a supply of 3,500 PSA 10s, let's just say, 
you know, they're, if they're not hitting the market and they're not available for sale, then you know that that creates kind of an is- interesting caveat to that, um, and that'll be and that'll be interesting, and that kind of and the same goes for that Luka that Luka Doncic silver prism when we're talking about down the road. You know, there might be some people that are just like, hey, look, I don't care if the thing is twenty thousand dollars, I'm not selling it. So you know that could be where you know you do see prices kind of continue to move up because there's a scarcity in the sense that people are choosing not to sell theirs. And that'll be really interesting to see in, in sports cards uh, over time. One thing I really wanted to address too is, you know, when we're talking about investments, we certainly want to keep our emotions, uh, you know, check our emotions, and not get sucked into buying, you know, our favorite players. For example, like I've, I've said in previous videos, I'm a diehard New Orleans Saints fan. I'd love to have every Drew Brees rookie card that there is, but to me. The timing's not right to invest in Drew Brees. It's not a good, you know, I'm not saying he's not a good long-term investment or even a short-term one right now. But for me, it, that's not the low-hanging fruit in sports card investing. So on the one hand, you want to check your emotions and make sure that you're not just investing in Saints players if it's me. Um, but at the same time, you know, have fun with it in the sense to where, look, I mean, there's so much inventory out there. Pick something that you are interested in. So. You know, if it's 86 Fleer stars, if you want to collect Barclays and Carl Malone rookies and, you know, all those great players that were in that 86 Fleer and that's your deal, then that's your deal and that's your thing and do that. If you see opportunities for investment that you honestly think it's not just an emotional buy, but you think there's opportunities, then make that happen. You know, if it's, um, you know, Michael Jordan cards, you know, he's got, he's the greatest of all time. So you could honestly say like, I mean, it might not be the greatest time to buy his stuff right now with the documentary. His pricing has gone pretty high. But once it settles back, I mean, maybe you just say, hey, look, I'm going all in on Michael Jordan or I'm going all in on LeBron. That's my guy. You know, that's that's fine. If it's an emotional decision, but it's also what you feel is a great long-term investment, you've got a good feeling about that player. It's just, you know, it's a greatest of all time. It's an iconic player. So I, I have no trouble investing my money in that in that player. Then then Absolutely. But you've got to, you know, make sure that you kind of, you know, understand the difference between that collector side of you and the investor side of you, because we all have that. We all, I have the investor side of me where I'm trying to make money, but I've also got that collector side of me that is like, hey, man, I just want, you know, I, I bought a, um, I bought a Brett Favre action-packed rookie today. It was seven bucks, so it didn't set me back a hundred dollars. But I'm not looking to flip it. It's just a card that I love as a kid. And I, I came across it on eBay and I was like, oh my God, I just want to have that. That's, you know, and that's a, that's, for me, that's for my collection. That's not, I'm not going to flip that in the next year or two years. So, you know, I think it's important just to kind of, when, you, when you're, you know, working with your resources, just understand the collector side and the investor side of yourself. And then the other part of that is buying packs and boxes. For investment purposes, you can't rip wax, in my opinion for investment purposes. If you're trying to buy boxes to rip wax to then resell and, and make a profit, that to me, that's a losing proposition. Now, if you're buying packs or boxes and you're keeping them sealed and you're gonna resell them down the line, that can be a, that can be a good investment. So certainly can't knock anybody for trying that or for doing that. And a lot of investors slash collectors do that. They will buy packs and boxes, hold them long-term and either open them down the road or they will resell them and there there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but again it's it's understanding if you're going to buy packs that you want to rip wax on just be okay with losing money on those that's just part of the that's the fun part of the hobby so just you know if you're with your 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 little ones and you want to you know you want to open packs great but don't buy flawless maybe if that's not within your you know or national treasures for that you know maybe it, it might be in your budget it's not in my budget um, but, you know, buy packs that, that are affordable, that, that you're okay losing money on. If you don't hit on that, that, if you don't get that major hit, you know, then, then you're in trouble. So certainly have fun with this thing. There's so many sets and so many price points. You can do it all, but just make sure that, you, that you're keeping your emotions in check and knowing, okay, this is investment. This is, this is collector stuff. Thanks for sticking with me guys through this. And again, I'm sorry for, for my poison ivy. Hopefully I can get through it over the next few days and, and, and look halfway normal again. But thank you very much for sticking with me and I will see you next time. Take care.